Joining us now for the fourth of five consecutive appearances here on the agenda all week long, we're happy to welcome back Jeremy Rifkin from the Foundation on Economic Trends. He's the author most recently of The Empathic Civilization, and he teaches at the Wharton School of Business, University of Pennsylvania, which we're advised is the oldest business school in the world. The world. Yeah. How old is that school? Uh, well, it celebrated our 125th anniversary about uh, seven, eight years ago. And you have not taught for all those years? No, but I actually was a student. I've been there off and on for a third of its existence. I started in the 1960s as a student there. Hmm. I've been teaching the advanced management program where we bring in uh, CEOs for their six-week, you know, retraining uh, for a long time. Okay. When we last uh, left our viewers, you were talking about the need to redefine progress for the 21st century. And why don't we start there? The um, you want to start with the Internet? You want to start with how the Internet has redefined progress for us? Well, I think uh, the Internet is very interesting because what it's done is it's connected us, the central nervous system of the human race, at the speed of light. It truly has annihilated time and space. You know, uh, when the, the, the great uh, earthquake hit Lisbon centuries ago, it was massive, but no one knew about it for six months or a year. When the earthquake hit Haiti, Within an hour, the Twitters were coming out, and within two hours, the first cell phone videos, and within three hours, an entire younger generation was there with an empathic brace to the, their neighbors, because they considered them neighbors. They were there. It was like looking at your backyard and watching this unfold. That can only happen in an Internet age. Absolutely. I'll give you another example. It's quite interesting. Two other examples. When the uh, Iran ele Iranian elections happened and they were flawed, Remember, the students took to the streets and protested, and one young pre-med student, her name was Nadia, was gunned down, yes. killed. At the same time that someone was taking a cell phone video of her, and that went around the world, that video, within an hour. Within two hours, millions and millions of young people around the world knew her Facebook, her family, totally empathizing with the students on the streets. That's the central nervous system of the human race connected. That is biosphere consciousness. I'll give you a third example, which is quite compelling for young people. Remember two years ago when that sh video came out showing a polar bear and her cub on an ice floe mm -hmm. in August, and of course there were open waters because of climate change, and we haven't had open waters in the Arctic for millions of years. The last four years, open waters, and in the, in the, the cub and her mother were on the fl ice floe and they were teetering. You knew they weren't going to make it. An entire human race was there as if that was them experiencing them. That's the interconnectedness we're now facing in the world. But those, certainly the first two examples, and maybe even the third one as well, I think it's fair to say that the people who took the lead in responding to these things are the younger generation. Absolutely. They're the people who are so tuned into this. Is that to suggest that it's, you know, in some ways, you know, guys my age, guys your age, it's a bit too late for us. These, the, the people coming up behind us well, are the guys who are going to do it. it's not too late for you. I think it's way too late for me. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, at, what's so interesting... I'm closer to your age than you think I am. All right. Well, yeah. the young, well, you're doing good then. The younger <laughs> generation is quite interesting. Uh, uh, the younger generation is, their mind thinks completely differently because they are wired by uh, internet communication, just like... Um, uh, a television generation was wired in a different way in the mind, or a print generation, or somebody based in script, or all generations. Mm -hmm. Those communication revolutions actually changed the way the mind functions. So our young people, for example, uh, they're doing things we would never do. They're up on the internet, and they're file sharing music. Mm -hmm. They're collaborating in social spaces like Wikipedia and YouTube. They're sharing code in places like Linux. Now, we would have said that can't be. That's the commons. Garrett Hardin, a great ecologist in the 60s, said nobody would ever share with each other to advance the common good because we are basically a selfish creature and there would be freeloaders, so you could never collaborate on a commons to optimize everyone's interest because the freeloaders and the selfish people would, would rule. So we called it the tragedy of the commons. Mm -hmm. And he said that's human nature. Well, apparently millions and millions and millions of kids around the world didn't hear about the tragedy of the commons because they're all collaborating and sharing knowledge in a transparent way and optimizing the good of the group. That flies in the face of Adam Smith's dictum, the founder of modern economics, that mm -hmm. each person by nature is driven to only pursue their individual selfish interests, and if they all do that, the common good is benefited, which I always thought was rather dubious uh, proposition. So they've so redefined progress. They're redefining progress not as each individual autonomous agent uh, uh, pursuing their own utility and self-interest or even their self-development, but they're defining progress as 
the human race coming together and collaborating and sharing information uh, so that we can optimize the good of the whole. This is what we call a new dream. But I wonder it's if that's quality still, of life. Is that still, that's generational. And I wonder if that can even compete and win over old fashioned cleavages like we happen to live in a democracy here and the youth of China happen to live in an authoritarian country. Well, this is a good example of another thing that's changing our ideas about progress. In the first in industrial revolution and second industrial revolution, we defined progress as tautological with, uh, with acquiring property and becoming happy. In other words, if you acquired property and were productive, you'd be more independent and autonomous, you'd be happier, you'd be making progress. And if everyone did that, that's the collective way to define progress. More productivity, more accumulation of wealth, more independence, more happiness, more progress. In fact, in the US, we would say life, liberty, and property, or sometimes we'd say life, liberty, and happiness, because property and happiness were interchangeable. John Locke believed the more property you accumulated, and the more happy you would be. John McCain proves that can't be true. Well, uh, not only that. He's got nine houses and he didn't win. Not only that, the new studies on happiness show that, that, that we misdefined progress because we used to think the more wealth, the more happy, the more progress you're making individually and collectively. The new studies on happiness are showing we got it wrong. That isn't about human nature. If you're very poor, and 40% of the human race is very poor, living on under $2 a day, barely surviving, all right? If you're very poor, you're not happy. And you can't even extend yourself uh, and, and feel empathic regard to those beyond your immediate concerns. You can't think about the polar bears in the Arctic. You're on a garbage heap trying to get some food for your kids. Mm -hmm. As you get wealthier, you get happier. Until you reach a threshold of comfort, in some societies it's around 20,000 a year or less. When you reach that threshold of comfort, that's the plateau of happiness. As you get more wealth after that, the increments of happiness get smaller, and at some point, more wealth, you become unhappy, you become envious, paranoid about your possessions, they end up taking over, and you're constantly thinking about your money, and they literally enslave you. So what we're learning is that happiness has a threshold. So the question is this, we're living in a world where half the human race, us, are living way beyond our sustainable ability to be on this planet. We have a huge ecological footprint, and we're becoming increasingly unhappy. Hmm. And the other hand, we have 40% of the human race under $2 a day. They're in poverty. They can't even eat out of survival. They're not happy. So how do we change the equation so that, that the half of the human race, it's us, have a smaller ecological footprint and learn to live more sustainably while the bottom half of the human race can come up and we meet at the comfort zone it's called quality of life. More egalitarian societies. Absolutely. And we find that the more there's a gap between rich and poor in society, the more unhappiness there is across the board. The smaller the gap and the better the quality of life, you have to have both, the, the more people are able to be social and be able to show bonds of solidarity. So that's why the European model to some extent is very interesting because it's a social market model. Uh, the EU is the, is the lead economy in the world. Aren't we an acquisitive people, though, and theoretically shouldn't that mean that the more we get, the happier we ought to be? Well, actually, the new studies show that, uh, that our Enlightenment philosophers misunderstood human nature, saying we're, we're born to be uh, an acquisitive, competitive, even predatory, little utilitarian materialist. Uh, the new studies at the cutting edge of evolutionary biology and in neurocognitive science and child development say, actually, that's not what babies are. Those are secondary drives. The, we're now learning with these new discoveries that, are, that we, human beings, are softwired not for competition and predatory behavior and materialism and narcissism. We are actually softwired for empathy. Okay, that's where I'm, I'm going to stop you there because that's tomorrow's program. We're going to get into all that tomorrow. All right. But I do want to, I want to better understand how this generation, the one coming, the many generations coming up behind you and me, how they define progress differently from how you and I might. Because certainly when we were we were raised to get a good education and to try to go out there and get as good a job as possible and, and you know get as good a house as you can, buy as nice a car as you can and all that stuff. Is that what motivates them? Well, that's the old American dream, which was the, the gold standard for two centuries. And the reason that became such a prominent dream, when, when people came to the United States and Canada, especially in the US, uh, you have to understand the historical moment. This was 200 years ago. It was the last stages of the Protestant Reformation in Europe. It was the early stages of the Enlightenment. So when the migra migrants came to North America, we kept those ideas in a time capsule. <laughs> Europe went on to other things. 
But we are, the, and especially the U.S., we are the staunchest supporters of Calvinist thinking, the, the Protestant work ethic, mm -hmm. all right? And we are the fiercest champions of Adam Smith's idea of individual self-interest in the market because we kept it in a time capsule for 200 years. Europe sort of tempered it with other things. Uh, and so that motivated us. The American dream is based on the idea that each, it's a tough society, America, U.S., uh, but if you work hard, if you sacrifice, you can make something out of your life or at least have a better life for your children, which we define as more, better accumulation of wealth, more property, so we can be more independent, be an island to ourselves, and if we're more independent and autonomous, we're more free. Because we define freedom as exclusivity, the right to be an island, the right to be invulnerable, John Wayne. That's the old idea. That doesn't fit a biosphere world. Right. In a, in a world today where we're trying to globalize society and bring 6.8 billion people together to live sustainably and justly, and to see the biosphere as our community with our fellow creatures, you can't have 6.8 billion cowboys, each being an island to themselves, pursuing their self-interest in a libertarian fashion. What, what we we're beginning to do is change our notion of property. The old idea of property, in the very ancient days, there were two ideas of property. One is the idea of property as something you personally own. That was not a big idea. The other idea was you property, you had property in terms of your right to access to public spaces, the forest, so you could forage and hunt. That was public property, or navigating rivers, or common pathways. So the older idea of property was the right to be included and have access to the public square. In the industrial age, we started to, to to narrow that idea of property and expand the idea that each person's an island, we surround ourselves by our possessions, mine versus thine, geopolitics. Now, what's happened with a younger generation, check it out with your own children, they're less interested in ownership and the idea of freedom as property and in independence and an island to oneself, they're more interested in access. They're more interested in redefining property as the right to be included in networks the right to have access, and the Chinese kids are the best example. What's going on in China against this centralized authoritarian regime that won't let Google in, the kids are hopping mad because they define access, the right to be included, as the new way of defining property relations. But what's to say that those 20-somethings who are thinking that way today, once they become 30-something and have children of their own and 40-something and want to get better jobs, aren't going to just change values and, and become what you and I are. Because the third industrial revolution creates a collaborative society. Oh. It's a completely different framework. When we distribute communication and energy, create collaborative spaces, we begin, we don't give up individual responsibility, we don't give entrepreneurship up, but that entrepreneurship has to be within the larger framework of collaboration. So the kids growing up today, file sharing music, Wikipedia, YouTube, Google, their whole mind is how to collaborate and it's more exciting for them to create prosperity based on collaboration. So here's how the dreams change. Sure. If you check out any young person across most of Canada, millennial generation, they don't think in terms of that old gold standard of each individual, productive, industrious, efficient, wealth, an island to oneself. That would be the kiss of death for them. If you ask the kids around Europe and America and other places today, the millennial kids, what their dream is, they'll use this new term called quality of life. I never heard of that when I was a kid. <laughs> quality of life. And you ask them what it means, they mean the right to the, they define freedom as the ability to optimize the fullness of their relationships. Because for them, it's all about relationships and connectivity. So freedom for them is not being an island. Freedom for them, that would be death. Freedom for them is the ability to optimize their relationships and connections and have access to all sorts of communities and meanings. So for them, the dream is quality of life. That's a, that's a community-wide ex exercise. And in our last 30 seconds, the education system promotes this as well? Well, the old education system is terrible because it promotes uh, the, the 19th and 20th century idea. You go into school, the first thing you learn, knowledge is power. Grab it. The second thing you learn is sharing is cheating. <laughs> no collaboration. The third thing you learn is to be productive and competitive. And the fourth thing you learn is the mission of education is to turn out little uh, efficient, productive workers. Now, there's nothing wrong with that as a subset. But what I believe is starting to happen in our educational system is we're redefining it for an internet generation. More and more education is collaborative. It's distributed. It's networked. 
Kids are doing service learning in the communities. They're Skyping in classrooms around the world. They're beginning to realize you share knowledge because knowledge is something that allows you to be creative and that the group wisdom exceeds the wisdom of the individual by themselves. That's an education, a new idea of progress. And tomorrow we pick up on another new idea, the notion that we are way more empathic than we heretofore had thought. Jeremy Rifkin will do it one more time. Okay. Thanks so much.